Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another climate justice working group meeting. I appreciate everyone taking the time out of their very busy schedules to be with us today. Um, go to the next slide. Um, as we see, our meeting procedures are uh, pretty much the same as always. If you're not speaking, uh, be on mute. Uh, for the sake of the transcript, uh, try to say your name before you start talking. It just helps us uh, when we're looking for uh, identifying specific things or items that folks want to pull out. Um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to use the hand raise function or even in the chat. As you guys well know, you can put stack in the chat. That's just fine. Um, next slide. So we're going to do a roll call. Um, I can just start. Obviously, Lana Cadell, Tucky, I am here. Uh, I'll just go down by the list of what I see. Chris. If you're talking, I can't hear you. Oh, double mute. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> just saying present. Chris Cole from the Serta. <laughs> uh, uh, Eddie. Hey, sorry. Stuck in double mute land with, <laughs> uh, with Chris. I don't know what that is, but uh, hey, everybody. Hi, uh, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Elizabeth. Presente. Jill. Hi, present. Hi, uh, Joe. Everybody, this is Joe McNerney with the New York State Department of Labor. And I believe that's it for uh, working group members. Uh, we're joined today by uh, DEC staff. Um, we also have a loom present today. Alex Dunn is here. Hi, Alex. Hello. And I'm we also have single. <laughs> Everyone's a double mute today. Um, we also have joining us our Deputy Commissioner for Equity and Justice, Adriana Spinoza. Uh, we have. Hi, everyone. Um, Basil Sagos, our Commissioner, is here today. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jared Snyder, our Commissioner for Energy. Good afternoon. And we have uh, additional staff, Samir, who's with us from NYSERDA and Tyler and uh, our DAR uh, reps, Marilyn Worth and Randy Walker are here and they'll be giving a presentation today. Um, if we could move forward to the next slide. Um, unfortunately, I do not believe there are enough folks on the uh, call today in order to do the approval of the minutes. So that's fine. We can just uh, eliminate that from the agenda and uh, move forward since we uh, we probably would need at least seven. And just to make sure that we're doing everything and everything's above board, I think we're just going to uh, move forward with the next part of our agenda, which is to discuss um, the CAC update. So after that, uh, we will discuss our approach to disadvantaged communities and air monitoring and uh, have a quick conversation about uh, the criteria, the maps, and our public education sessions. Does anybody have any questions? All right, so let's move on and we can discuss our, uh, as you see, we can get a, uh, we'll get an update on our CIC responses and climate justice uh, working group input. Um, so, I am going to throw this over to Basil. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Alana. Um, and I'll be brief. I, I'm actually going to, I need to jump into another meeting shortly after this, but I, I really just wanted to come on right now, uh, say two things. First of all, uh, thank you. Um, it's been a, a long road since we kicked this off and um, you, you, uh, you got the draft disadvantaged communities criteria out last week for public comment. And I just want to say how proud I am um, of the work that you did and how uh, remarkable the, the effort was. Um, you know, both uh, Eddie and Elizabeth and Sono and I and a few others, uh, Doreen, were at a, an event uh, last week with uh, Chair Grijalva, Chair Maloney from uh, our Congress. 
And um, it's clear New York is way ahead of uh, the feds on this and ahead of every other state when it comes to uh, disadvantaged criteria and also the recognition of race as a, as a criteria, uh, which, which of course I know the federal government is, is not doing for its own reasons. Um, but also the, the work that we've done to, to push investments, uh, over, over benefits. And, and I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm grateful that, that you all said yes to, to serving on this, um, on this important body and, uh, and that you've done great work. I know we're not done yet, but, um, considerable amount of work ahead of us, but, but it's a, it's, it's a really good start. Um, so that is first. Second, um, I just want to recognize, and I, I was not around for the last meeting, but I got a download from my staff, as I've told some of you, um, uh, aware that some of the members of the group expressed concern that um, the the group's input has not been uh, heard by the by the overall CAC and, and not reflected in the scoping plan. And I just want to make sure that you understand that uh, for me, I, I certainly uh, heard your input. I know that uh, the, the members of the CAC did as well. And, um, and I think what, what we want to do is ensure that, that, uh, you all see how, uh, your input thus far has been incorporated. So, um, you know, it's, it is a value relationship, but there's also substantive, uh, uh ideas that you've given us. And, um, and that is in, uh, reflected in part in the, uh, in the scoping plan. Um, Samir can, can go through that in a moment. Um, and uh, we'll also be memorializing that in the letter from the CAC to all the members uh, in the coming uh, coming days. Um, so you'll you'll have a chance to see specifically how the how your feedback was incorporated into the into the huge document. Um, but please uh, just know that this is not the uh, end of the road. We expect this year to have a very uh, vibrant discussion with you. I'd certainly have after you have a chance to to see what we send back to you. Um, we'd love to have a chance to reconnect on it and get your reactions uh, to to uh, to our our formal letter on that, and then you know continue the ongoing conversation uh, and not ask you to do uh, more work necessarily, but um, to uh, to keep guiding us uh, in the right direction with all the really good ideas you brought us. So uh, mainly, again, I just wanted to say thank you and also to reassure you that uh, we are listening and we do intend to to keep uh, this this conversation uh, moving in the right direction. So thank thank you. I'll take take any questions, but I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. And additionally, uh, what I what I just told you right now, Dorian and I are, are sending you all a letter that we wanted to get out before this meeting, um, but it it should get out probably mid meeting. Uh, Dorian and I both to sign it and get it to you. Did anyone have any questions? Okay, um, we've been joined by uh, Neil Mastelio. Uh, just jumped on. Hi, Neil. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I'm late. No worries. Hi, Neil, and thank you for that, Commissioner Sager. Thank you. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, we can throw this over to Samir. Samir. Great. Um, yeah, just echoing that. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, there's, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? There's a couple of things I want to cover. Um, first, as previously requested, we are preparing detailed information in the form of a spreadsheet on how the feedback you previously provided was considered in the draft scoping plan. And this will go chapter by chapter and provide a mapping of where the feedback you gave was captured in the draft scoping plan. We're currently on track to get you this document by next week. Once you've digested it, we'll develop a plan on how you'd like to engage the council going forward. The document will also be shared with the council so they can determine if there are areas where they'd like further discussion or to further integrate your feedback into the recommendations. So please stay tuned for an email from me soon with next steps on this. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to provide a recap of the March 3 Climate Action Council meeting and provide a brief overview of the public hearing schedule for the scoping plan. The council met for the first time this year 
and the focus was on the 2022 work plan. They discussed the decision making process, the timeline, which you can see at a high level on the slide, and the potential creation of subgroups focused on the sectors that require deeper deliberation, like approaches to the gas system transition, potential applications of advanced fuels, and economy-wide approaches. Deputy Commissioner Espinoza was introduced at the meeting, and she emphasized the importance of equity and justice deserving maximal consideration in the scoping plan in order to achieve the Climate Act's transformative aims to eliminate the disproportionate burden of environmental pollution and climate change that is borne by low-income populations, indigenous nations, and communities of color. So every New Yorker may enjoy the full benefits of climate action. This ensures we respond to the climate crisis in a way that is holistic, long-lasting, and unifies the entire state around our common future. Next slide, please. Another crucial aspect that will shape the final version of the scoping plan are the public comments received. I'm really thrilled to say the public hearing schedule has been finalized and the written public comment period has been extended to June 10. We will be holding 10 hearings, which is four more than the six required. Eight of those will be in-person hearings and there will be two virtual hearings for those who can't attend in person. Although we can't hold an in-person public hearing in every location across the state, we worked really hard to identify areas that cover New York's expansive geographic regions for locations where in-person hearings won't be held. State staff, including myself, are planning to participate in various conferences and meetings throughout the extended public comment period to present on the draft scoping plan. Lastly, we'll be conducting a robust public outreach and education effort in disadvantaged communities across the state with the goal of ensuring community members are aware of the scoping plan and have an opportunity to provide comments and otherwise meaningfully participate in the implementation of the law. If you um, would like to promote these hearings, we'll be developing a toolkit with sample email blast language and social media posts that you can share. And I hope to see some of you at the hearings Thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Alana. Thank you, Samir. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're going what? to, oh, oh, sorry. Did you have a question? Sorry, did not mean to jump in. No, no, no worries, on. Alana. No, no worries. <laughs> uh, just, uh, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, yeah, I want to thank the, I want to thank Commissioner Sagos and, and Samir for, uh, um, um, you know, uh, reflecting on how we may be hearing uh, direct um, um, a direct reflection of our feedback to the to the draft, or not the draft, but the uh, the previous working group um, uh, recommendation. So it's really uh, it's going to be helpful to to, to see that. Uh, what I would recommend, um, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know how I I, I, I suspect it's probably the same with with the rest of my. Uh, of my working group colleagues, I, I don't know, and I've gone back and forth as what the value might be of the climate justice working group weighing in on the overall draft scoping plan uh, or, or components of it or how, however that feedback is envisioned. Um, I, I, I've, on the one hand, I've thought it might, it's, it's, it may be useful to lift up uh, 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 you know the, the the components of the draft scoping plan that 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 um, has uh, impacts in in terms of um, um, disparities and 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 differently uh, uh, resourced communities. Um, uh, but by the same token, I also wonder um, how useful that is because it'll just be uh, feedback like the public is giving, like everyone else is. It's going to be equal. In, it's going to be equal input. Um, uh, you know, the way any other New Yorkers input would be received. Um, and, and it, you know, again, it would have been helpful to know um, in the pre draft scoping release, how those comments were incorporated, but, but, you know, better late than never, we'll, we'll take it. Um, so I, I don't know. And I would love to hear at some point, once we get the feedback, um, we'd love to hear how, how others feel about 
presenting yet again to, to the Climate Action Council. Uh, but putting that aside, whether we elect to do that or not, what I would recommend us, uh, Samir, is if you all are, are if, if you haven't, if you've done so already or in the midst of doing it, if you guys are collating uh, the feedback that the Climate Justice Working Group gave to the different um, uh, working group recommendations, what I would do is identify which of those speak to those three subgroups of the Climate Action Council, forget what they were, whether it was gas transitions, economy-wide approach, it was a third. But what I would do is, is take our feedback that speak to those three uh, buckets of work and reshare that with the Climate Action Council so that you know it's more deliberate and it's more intentional, it's more focused on, on what these three working groups uh, uh, are gonna cover. I know for a fact that there were multiple recommendations that we made that spoke to gas transitions, that spoke to the economy-wide approach. So it, 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 it can only help, I would think, um, the Climate Action Council, if, 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 if our, the Climate Justice Working Group comments could be collated and curated to speak to those three buckets and shared uh, um, uh, with the Climate Action Council there. So uh, uh, thanks again, but um, I, I think that might be, that might add, add some value. Yeah. Thanks, Eddie. And, and, and let me re-talk it over with others, but, but, but it's currently broken down by sector, your feedback, which largely um, matches to those three. I mean, I think you can do that. So, because, yeah, so we can um, just kind of rejigger some things and to, to get it in a way that allows you to see um, how your input is is already integrated into those those three main areas, as well as provide the other sectors in which you gave it. Right, so I, I, I'm not, I'm, I want to make sure I'm, I'm being clear. I, I didn't mean necessarily for us. I meant for the Climate yeah. Action yeah. Council. For those three, yeah. Um, what I what I heard was that the Climate Action Council will will break it up, up into three smaller working groups, and that's what I meant. Is is our feedback that speaks to each of those three working groups? Make sure those Climate Action Council members have access to our, to our feedback there. Yeah, yeah. It'll be two ways. Three, they'll get it too. Go ahead, Jared. Yeah, and and uh, hey, it's uh, Jared. I'll, I'll just add that those three working groups are all somewhat cross-sectoral, so it may be you know taking input from different chapters and providing that to those working groups. But I would also say, Eddie, um, you know, those are not the only open issues. Those are those are you know three issues that that we thought we needed to dive into further with the council. But but you know the the climate justice working group should. Feel Feel free to, to you know, provide its perspective on you know any other issues in the scoping plan, and and it, it's not just, you know, along with the rest of the public. You know, you have an opportunity for a dialogue with the council. The rest of the public is providing comments at these hearings. No dialogue. So you know, it's it's definitely a different position that the climate justice working group has, and as as Basil explained, we take it very seriously. Okay. Well, if does anybody else have any questions or comments? I don't want to interrupt anyone else. All right. Well, Jared, you were speaking and you were the next person to go up. So why don't you just jump right in? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll be brief. Um, we're, we're still working out uh, some of the details on the community air monitoring program, but what we'd like to provide today is an overview of the strategy that we'll use to select the communities for monitoring and, and get your input on, on that methodology. The, the CLCPA requires monitoring in, in only four communities, but as announced by Commissioner, excuse me, Governor Hochul, our current plan is to conduct a large scale monitor, screening effort in 10 communities benefiting around 5 million people, so much broader than what was what required by the CLCPA itself. Um, our current expectation is this would involve a broad statewide effort, sort of a screening effort, coupled with more targeted monitoring in areas with higher burdens um, based on a collaborative effort with local partners. And, you know, we'll be in a better position to identify those details at a future meeting after the budget is complete. 
Uh, but we see this as a community-driven effort to, to build upon the statewide screening effort. So the statewide screening effort plus this targeted um, effort in, in some communities. The purpose of this effort is to lay the groundwork for identifying solutions for areas impacted by higher levels of pollution. As the monitoring is underway, we'll be meeting, we'll be establishing partnerships to coordinate the development of solutions with representatives of the communities where monitoring is taking place. So I'd like to now turn it over to Marilyn Wirth uh, from the Division of Air Resources to describe how we're proposing to select the communities in accordance with the CLCPA's requirement that the monitoring take place in communities with a larger pollution burden. So Marilyn will, will describe how we're gonna select those 10 communities. And although DEC will select the communities, we're very interested in your input on the methodology uh, to use in selecting those communities. So Marilyn, it's all yours now. Okay, thank you, Jared. Alana, do I have? Yep. Uh, yep. You should have the. Yep. You should have the little host bell, so you should be able to share your screen now. Let's see. can see it. Okay, good. Okay, great. Thank you. So, good afternoon. My name is Marilyn Worth, and I'm a research scientist with DEC's Division of Air Resources. Thank you for your time and attention today. I would like to share with you our draft approach to select disadvantaged communities for air monitoring, and I look forward to hearing your feedback. First, we will review the CLCPA requirements for community air monitoring. Then discuss how the approach uses the draft DAC census track list and data to come up with a burden score for air pollution, followed by an example of an exploratory mapping tool to look at the DACs with high scores and how the climate justice work group can provide input on the draft approach and the communities can share their knowledge and concerns. Placing emphasis on the last agenda item. We know this input is critical to understand the air pollution concerns that are most important to the community. Here's the exact language from the law to remind us of the requirements, such as evaluating sensitive receptor locations with high exposure burdens. Keeping in mind the goal of the air monitoring is to come up with emissions reduction strategies by June 1, 2024. We started with the draft set DAC census track list derived from the combined scores, which are the multiplicative products of the environmental burdens and climate risks and the population characteristics and health vulnerabilities. Out of the 45 total indicators, we chose 12 environmental burden indicators most associated with air pollution burden from the potential pollution exposure and land use categories. We use the same methodology and data to calculate an air pollution burden score by averaging the sum of the percentile ranks for each of the indicators and then generating statewide percentile ranks for the census tracts. The air pollution burden score percentiles were incorporated into the table with the DAC, non DAC designations and corresponding data. I'd like to emphasize that this approach is an initial screening and we will be considering other data sources to refine the selection process that I will discuss later. There are also limitations associated with the air pollution exposure and burden layers. The technical documentation discusses all the limitations. Some examples include for traffic density, buffers are used to estimate counts of vehicles across census tracts and they miss hot spots. And for land use and proximity to facilities, count of sources within a certain radius and distance may not represent actual risk or even exposure as pollution toxicity, dispersion, or migration are not considered. After we have calculated the air pollution burden Maryland? score. Yes. Hi, uh, this is Adriana. If we could go back to the last slide. Um, sure. I 
the, the 12 indicators that you pointed out are kind of small and my eyes are bad. So maybe there are some in the public who also can't read the 12. I was wondering if you could just uh, name the 12 uh, uh, verbally just in case people yeah, can't sure. read that. Sure, thank you for pointing that out. So under the potential pollution exposures, we have vehicle traffic density, diesel truck and bus traffic, particulate matter or PM 2.5, benzene concentrations, and then under land use, we have remediation sites, regulated management plan or chemical sites, major oil storage facilities, power generation facilities, active landfills, municipal waste combustors, scrap metal processors, and industrial manufacturing mine la mining land use um, zoning category. Thank you. You're welcome. After we have calculated the air pollution burden score, we rank all the census tracts from high to low based upon the percentiles, and then divide the data into three groups, top, middle, and bottom 33%, because our goal is to identify locations with high air pollution burden. The tracts are separated by their DAC and non-DAC designations. This table is an example of the data showing the DACs and non-DACs along with their corresponding percentile scores for the, for the combined score statewide and the additional air pollution burden score, which is a subset of the environmental burden component. We retain the non-DACs with higher relative burden scores for further evaluation that I will discuss later. For example, you see this non-DAC census tract has an air pollution burden score percentile of 98.92%. A histogram is a way to look at a data distribution, and here we see the distribution of the number of DAC census tracts or frequency along the vertical axis for each air pollution burden score percentile along the horizontal axis. You see 21% of the total DAC census tracts are in the top group with the highest air pollution burden. A box plot shows the average burden score value of 67. So the top group has burden scores that are above average. The bottom line is there are more people living in DAC census tracts with top air pollution burden scores. This agrees with research showing that disadvantaged people are disproportionately burdened by air pollution. The histogram for the non-DAC burden scores shows the opposite. More people are living in non-DAC census tracts with bottom air pollution burden scores and the average score of 41 is lower than the DAC average score. This scatter plot shows the relationship of the DACs, which are purple circles, and non-DACs, blue open circles, for two variables, the air pollution burden score on the vertical axis and the combined score statewide on the horizontal axis. I thought it would be interesting to look at this correlation because to be identified as a DAC, Communities must score high to moderately high on both environmental and population vulnerability components or high in one and moderately high in the other. When we break out the top, the middle and bottom 33% for air pollution burden scores, we see an overall trend. Looking from the left to the right on the graph, as the DAC air pollution burden scores increase, the combined scores increase. With the upper right hand quadrant of DAC showing the most census tracts having the highest air pollution burden in combined scores statewide. We talked about retaining the non DACs for further evaluation, and you see how the non DAC and DAC, DAC values are mixed in the top and middle groups. So, where are the DAC census tracts in the top, middle, and bottom groups? Each dot is a census tract with latitude and longitude coordinates, so it's easy to map and identify them. This graph shows the regions with the most DACs with the top air pollution burden scores and combined scores with percentiles greater than 73. New York City has the most DACs meeting both these conditions, followed by Mid-Hudson, Western New York, Finger Lakes, and Capital Region. For the middle air pollution burden scores, New York City still has the most census tracts, followed by Mid-Hudson, Finger Lakes, Western New York, 
central New York capital region and a few tracks now show up in the Mohawk Valley. For the lowest air pollution burden scores, there are only 38 census tracts, with Mid Hudson, Finger Lakes, and Central New York having a few more, New York City only having four, and there's now one in the North Country. When looking at these graphs, it's important to remember that the census tracts vary in size and population. So let's look at the DAC population numbers. These graphs show the sum of the population count for DACs with the top air pollution burden in five counties of New York City on the left and for the rest of the state on the right. The North Country and Mohawk Valley regions do not have DACs with top air pollution burden scores. In order to prioritize the selection of specific DACs with high air pollution burden, we will need to do additional analyses with other data sources and consider the weight of the evidence, examining all the data for all DACs initially. Additional data may include community air quality concerns, emissions inventories, air monitoring data from our reference sites, other monitoring studies and modeling, such as New York City Community Air Survey, and also considering the number and types of sources within a, a community, possibly proactively thinking about mission reduction strategies, and per the law, definitely looking at the locations of sensitive receptors in relation to our regulated facilities. Also evaluating non-DACs in relation to DACs. Geographically, the DAC and non-DAC census tracts with high air pollution burden may be intermixed. I will show you maps of the DACs and non-DACs to demonstrate how they may be used to refine the monitoring boundaries. This refined selection process requires an integrated mapping approach using all the data layers. To start, I have used Google Maps to create a prototype to display the location of the DACs and non-DACs with their corresponding air pollution burden scores. I will show you some examples of these maps. The data analysis I have shown you and these maps are just examples of the, of the approach. More work to needs to be done at the census tract level to specifically identify the communities. This map is a zoomed out view of the top DAC and non-DAC air pollution burden scores. DACs are the red stars and non-DACs are the blue circles. You see they are aligning in similar areas across the state. And when you zoom in, you get a better picture of their relationship to one another. Here's also the total population for each of these layers. This map is a zoomed in view of the highest DAC air pollution burden score of 100 circled on the map and found in the Bronx. Clicking on the stars displays the air pollution burden score for the census tracts and the individual ranks for the air pollution burden indicators. This map shows the New York City community districts and how the data or the stars indicating the top DACs are located within the district. The arrow on the map points to the lower east side, and you can see how the grouping of census tracts with high air pollution burden scores fall neatly within the boundary. This is Buffalo, New York, and the map displays DAC top as red stars, DAC middle as yellow circles, and non-DAC top values as blue circles. Looking at the map, you see some DAC top values with middle DAC and non-DAC top values in between. The non-DAC values on the very outer edge of the area could help define the monitoring boundary. This is an example of how Google Maps or a similar mapping tool could be used by the community to collect their input by dropping a pin and providing a description of the air quality concerns and observations. This information could help inform the selection process along with the strategies for improved community engagement and communication for data reporting. We are looking at similar mapping tools used by other states. For example, California Bay Air Quality Management District uses social pinpoint mapping tool to collect community input for air pollution concerns. They also include inputs such as locations where people gather, especially seniors, young people or community members with increased health risk, and community strengths and resources, including locations which 
represent culture, history, and the strengths of the community. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to acknowledge my uh, colleague, Randy Walker, who provided a lot of input on this whole uh, draft approach. So uh, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Marilyn, I do have a question. This is Abby. Uh, sure. First of all, thank you very much for this presentation. It was quite interesting. Can we sure. go back really quickly? I think it was maybe slide eight or nine. Could it have been that far back? I'm not sure. So the one where you had, yes, yes, okay. the next one. Um, so I was just trying to interpret on this. If I see Finger Lakes region seems to be high up. So I'm from the Finger Lakes region. That's why I'm concerned <laughs> about the Finger Lakes region. Fairly sure. high on all of these, but then on the next slide, it looked like Finger Lakes was lower. And I was just trying to like reconcile that. And I just didn't really get it. So okay, so this slide is actually showing you the um, DAC burden score in combination with the combined score. So you're using the combined score statewide sort of as a filter. So we're trying to capture the highest combined score, which is greater than the 73rd percentile, and then the top DAC and middle DAC, and then the bottom DAC air pollution burden scores. But the next slide was just demonstrating, because I made the point, so I'm showing you the number of census tracts in each of these regions, but just the point that um, there's different um, sizes of census tracts and populations. So when you go here, what I was trying to show you is there's a difference in population. So the Finger Lakes has a, a smaller population with the um, top DAC burden score. Okay, that totally makes sense. Is that helpful? <laughs> yes, thank you. And so my, yeah. my second follow-up question is that those different maps do you already have one for the Finger Lakes region that you can I do. <laughs> I was anticipating. <laughs> so, yes, I have some in the um, additional slides. It's just a zoomed in view of. Um, so I wanted to give some people an idea of what. The area looked like for the DAC top. 33%, the middle 33% um, and then the non DAC. And if you zoom in, you can see. Um, you know, obviously where the, the high um, values are versus the, the middle, but this is just kind of like a zoomed out view. And are these maps that we can have access to, to like poke around a little more and look at the details? So I do have the prototype that's in Google Maps. Um, I think we're working on that and the details of that. Like I said, this was just a prototype but it is easy to access um, and, you know, I think we're going to refine it. And then I think that might be an opportunity for um, work group members or the community to have input on this approach. Okay. Great, thank you. Sure. Hi, it's Eddie. Uh, again, Marilyn, thank you so much. It's, it's, uh, sure. It, it's always um, it's both startling. It's it's by turn startling, frustrating, and affirming uh, to see it visually depicted. What what EJ uh, activists uh, have always known, which is the disparities are are mappable and 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 uh, palpable, right? And um, it just it just uh, it just it always feels like uh, it's always jarring to see it. Um, uh, visually depicted. I, my question, Marilyn, and, and not just for you, but for, for for your colleagues at DEC. I'm just wondering, uh, what 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 first impressions did you guys get when you saw uh, these maps? And and I'm just curious about uh, whether there were any any surprises for you all, or um, just just curious to see what 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 insights you you all may have had at the agency seeing this. So, Eddie, I don't think there were any. Big surprises, you know, we're very familiar with our emission sources. You know, we have our, our monitoring sites. Um, so the ones that sort of rose to the top, I don't think were, you know, it wasn't a surprise for me. 
Um, it's just getting down into the layers and looking at the census track and that detail. Um, that really that level of robust analysis needs to be done. And I think um, what was most informative for me was bringing in the other layers that um, the whole draft criteria brought to the table and looking at the two together. Um, I found that most informative and something um, you know, we haven't had this opportunity to look at this before. So what great work this is. And, you know, I really look forward to along with Randy, we're going to dig into this and our colleagues and really try to do the best job that we can. I'll just share my uh, reaction as well to seeing this. I think my initial reaction was, you know, it's almost the the lack of surprise that hurts the most, you know? It's like uh, seeing the Bronx sort of show up with a 100% score and, and recognizing the decades of, of uh, advocacy and, and scientific research that sort of, we knew we know this, right? It sort of underscores how much like work we still have to do uh, and, you know, just it hurts, you know, a little uh, or a lot thinking about uh, the the community members that live there and, and, and dealt with us every day. I guess I have a question for the um, work group. How do you feel about the community input? Do you think that that would be helpful if they had a tool where they could provide us with their concerns? Another layer that we could integrate into the analysis. Okay. <laughs> yes, for sure. You know, here in our community, I think it would be really helpful. Like, if there is a tool like that that's available to have some training that can be provided for people initially on how to use it and. Um, and ideally compensation too, you know, if we have, if we could have like a team of people who are out there kind of, um, that'd be great. Yeah, that's a good point. Training is very important. Um, just out of curiosity, and I, 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 I think I know the answer to this. Um, and the answer may be additional legislation, and I think some of us know exactly which bill I'm talking about, but um, uh, do you all foresee um, this information, this, 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 you know, agglomeration, this, this, this uh, um, curating and collating of all this stuff? Do you, what is the agency, how does the agency foresee this, uh, th these additional deeper layers of analysis possibly affecting permitting decisions, if at all? And I know that's a vague generic question, yeah. inviting yeah. a vague generic answer, but I figured go for it. Yeah, yeah so, I'm so gonna Eddie, let Jared. <laughs> yeah, why why don't I take that on? So so Eddie, you know, as as I said, this is all to inform sort of the problem solving. You know, this monitoring will identify, you know, where the problem sources are, whether that's, you know, heavy traffic in particular areas, you know conglomerations of warehouses, whether it's industrial sources. And then we need to consider that in, in all the decisions we make, whether it's regulatory decisions or permitting decisions. You know, um, you know Section 7.3 certainly plays a role there, um, you know, directing us to consider those kind of disproportionate impacts in, in making permitting decisions. So, you know, this information that comes out of this, this monitoring effort will will be helpful across the board and we will work closely with the community um, in 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 sort of each of the areas selected for monitoring to to you know get their input on what the problem sources are um, you know we have some knowledge obviously from our permitting but but you know people know what's next door to them and you know that's going to be important to 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 hear Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, 
Uh, Thank you. Noting, I think there was a question just put in the chat. Uh, hmm. Let's see. Yep, this is a question from. Uh, no, it's not a question from a panelist. But I guess we could ask it. Um, if there are any, uh, the question is, I would like to know if we could talk about green infrastructure development and working with communities on Staten Island's North Shore. I don't know if we um, have that specific information, um, but uh, particularly they'd like to see, uh, seeing that the communities in Staten Island bear the brunt of floods and climate catastrophe. They um, want to know how communities on the low end of the percentile, like for example, Richmond County, would receive funding. Yeah, was it, was Staten Island at all uh, flagged or the North Shore there uh, flagged in our map, Maryland? Maybe you can go back to the New York City. Uh, yeah, Rich. So it's let me check back there. Yeah, and and but but while Maryland's doing that, you know, this particular, you know. Community air monitoring effort is is focused on identifying, you know, the air pollution burdens, rather than you know the the other kind of climate resilience burdens. Which you know we have other programs that focus on those, but but this effort is 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 part of the goal of the CLCPA as we reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We also reduce other air pollution with a particular focus on disadvantaged communities. So this, this tool will very much help us target that work. Thanks for clarifying, Derek. Good point. And just to respond, Adriana, um, these graphs are regional and I did not break out um, New York City specifically. Then the graph that they're broken out for um, with the the five boroughs is for population. So, but as Jared said, this is um, the air pollution burden for those 12 indicators. Are there any other questions or comments folks would like to share before we move forward? Well, thank you, Marilyn, so much for this amazing presentation. Thank you, Randy. Uh, you guys are amazing as always, and I am always eternally grateful for all the assistance and help you've provided, uh, not just uh, the working group, but also the Office of Environmental Justice. So just, you know, round of applause because this was great. Thank you, Alana. We're happy to be a part of this important work. So thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments on this, we uh, can move forward. Uh, Andrew, if you could uh, go forward a slide. And we can just have a conversation about the uh, disadvantage criteria and the web page. Uh, one more slide, please. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So I wanted to start by thanking everyone uh, for their amazing work in getting the DAC criteria and the materials out for uh, comment. Um, and I want to thank everyone for their patience in uh, allowing us to get that out. Uh, we know that it definitely took longer than we initially anticipated, but we did end up getting that out and uh, just a Big uh, heartfelt thank you to everyone who was involved in that process. There's a lot of a lot of technical staff involved in making sure we got that out. So thanks to everyone, and thank you to the working group. Um, if you're still interested in having a quote for the press release, um, that can still be submitted online. Uh, we will definitely try to give you more mo notice next time. It's usually uh, 24 hours is kind of our standard practice, but in the future we'll definitely try to give you more notice. Um, the public comment period it ends on July 7th. So uh, for anyone who is listening in as a participant, uh, if you're interested in providing comments or for working group members, if you have community members, um, 
folks who are interested in submitting comments, uh, that comment period will end July 7th. So on the page, uh, if everybody had hope everyone has had an opportunity to take a look, but just to kind of give everyone a rundown of the materials that we released, uh, there is that interactive map of the communities that meet the disadvantage criteria that you all voted on, uh, disadvantaged communities criteria. There is a draft list of the disadvantaged communities. Uh, we have the technical documentation on those communities that kind of just runs through everything we've done for the past uh, 20 plus months. It's all there. Uh, there's also a summary document uh, for anyone who wants to sort of distribute that as sort of like a little bit more condensed version. There is that summary document. And uh, for those who are a little bit more wonky and uh, tech savvy, there is the technical documentation appendix. Uh, it has all of the um, indicator workbooks. Uh, next slide, please. And there's also additional materials for folks who are curious. So we have some frequently asked questions that are on that page. There's also a link to all of our climate justice working group meeting materials and not most importantly, but what I think is most important is the link to uh, open data. So folks can go to the open data site and download uh, extra data and the shape files so they can kind of take a look at everything. Um, we just want to make sure that uh, everybody reminds colleagues and community members to go to the site and look over all of the materials and leave us comments on the draft. Um, since the start of the comment period, there have been, and this uh, these numbers have changed. I hope they've increased since uh, I last saw them, but since then there were 517 page visits, uh, which is 119 unique visitors and 941 page views. Uh, the maps have had over 1600 views and open data has had 188 views and 18 downloads. So we are getting traffic. People are looking, they're downloading data and it's very exciting. I hope to see many, many, many more people uh, looking things up and checking out that page. And we hope to uh, really generate some good comments and good information from this. Uh, next slide. So here are the ways that everyone can provide public comments. Um, again, this information is on the website, but for anybody who's interested, um, you, there's a public comment form that's available on the Disadvantaged Communities uh, website. Just, you can just fill that out. Uh, you can also send comments to uh, DACcomments at dec.ny.gov. And you can also send them directly to the Office of Environmental Justice. Make sure it's attention draft DAC comments. All um, methods of submitting comments are uh, weighed equally. So don't think that just because it's sent through the mail that it's somehow weighed less or we take it less seriously than we would take comments uh, sent any other way. However, you can send in comments, feel free to submit them. Okay, uh, next slide. So before I go through this, does anybody have any questions or comments or concerns? All right, uh, so we can have another, so we'll talk a bit about the public engagement process. Uh, those will be our public education sessions and the uh, six hearings that are mandated by the CLCPA. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a, you know, a quick view of the legal requirements for the public uh, input process. Just basically states that you know, before it's finalized, we are going to publish the draft criteria, which we've done, and that will also hold uh, six regional public hearings, uh, at least three upstate and three downstate, and have at least a 120 day uh, comment period. Oh, did I hear someone? That might have just been me. <laughs> it could have been an echo. Um, and that there'll be meaningful opportunities for comment. Uh, so we can move forward to the next slide. So for the um, public engagement sessions, um, we kind of an outline of a plan. We're sort of still figuring out the details, but for these education sessions, um, the goal is still to host these two sessions in a WebEx format. Um, it's basically going to be designed to assist everyone with sort of technical questions and issues that, you know, folks might have, um, give them a quick look at what the maps 
look like or how they could be viewing the information or maybe some little tips and tricks that they might not have considered. Um, and we also plan to have a pre recorded session. I know Eddie, I know it's in web. <laughs> uh, we're still. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I already see the problems on the horizon. I'm just saying. You know what? You can definitely, yes, I understand. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, unfortunately, that is the, uh, I want to say, you know, that that's who we're sort of married to right now. <laughs> but we are, but that is uh, unfortunately where we are right now. But um, yes, I, I understand. And I, I also foresee some issues with that, but we'll hopefully be able to address them. Um, and we are still looking to have at least a pre recorded video that explains some of the documentation and the maps and the information uh, for reference. So folks can just kind of go back and take a look at that um, if they ever have any questions. Uh, are there any questions or concerns? Aside from Eddie's concern about WebEx. <laughs> okay. Uh, next slide, please. So for the hearings, um, we're still uh, working on it. We're still trying to figure out the details, but we are uh, moving towards a hybrid hearing schedule. So um, a mix of the virtual and in-person. And uh, we really are kind of still in the process of planning and scheduling. And um, but we don't want anyone to think we've forgotten anything. We are definitely, we're definitely reach out to everyone to make sure that all that information is available when it's ready. Um, we're still trying to figure a lot of this out and trying to make sure that our outreach and education strategy is tailored um, to with the information about the DACs and how it's tailored to meet people where they are and to so, so folks can see how this will, how these criteria will actually impact their community. And we want to make sure that people feel empowered to you know leave comments and to be involved even if they can't attend one of the hearings or they don't feel comfortable attending one of the hearings. Um, so that's still, we're still moving forward with that. Um, we definitely wanna make sure that uh, everybody is encouraging folks to join the hearings um, and, or just leave comments. Uh, we definitely wanna hear those comments. We wanna hear what people think. Uh, we're also looking to create a fact sheet, you know, and um, some, maybe some short tailored presentations of the criteria that are regionally specific. And we want to make sure that we're supplementing our hearings, not just with the education se sessions, but with a larger effort. Um, so that would offer uh, community based organizations and NGOs in disadvantaged communities across the state an opportunity to maybe present uh, to request a presentation of the criteria from us. So taking those education sessions and uh, drilling them down a little bit, narrowing them and having uh, smaller presentations for smaller groups. So the goal is to um, have that available and to do as many as we possibly can, um, obviously keeping uh, staff limitations and travel in mind. Um, and we also definitely absolutely welcome the support and involvement of Climate Justice Working Group members uh, wherever and meeting you guys where you are. So. However, and wherever you want to be involved, we definitely want to have you there. And translation, yes. So the goal for a lot of this is to make sure that we're um, having registration in advance so that we can make sure those translation services are available. So the goal will be to have people register, um, try to provide it, you know, those registration things in advance. Uh, we use language line. Um, so we try to make sure that we have that as even um, if there might be sign language services or uh, for other folks who might be hearing impaired, visually impaired. We try to make sure that we are making all of these meetings as accessible as possible. And yes, we're going to see if we can make uh, the materials and the PowerPoints available in Spanish if folks require it. Elizabeth, yes. And that's part of the reason why uh, we're, we're, you know, sticking to this uh, hybrid hearing schedule as opposed to doing all in person or all virtual, uh, because you know we we have found particularly from a virtual setting, uh, it's it's much more conducive to being able to have to to have simultaneous uh, interpretation um, and uh, in sign language and just is much more accessible in, in general. And so we hope to be able to. Uh, 
uh, that, that sort of the mix can can capture as many people uh, as possible. And, and definitely want to translate uh, material. Okay, uh, next page, please, or next slide, please. So, uh, I wanted to also have a uh, just tell you quickly about our analysis of the public comments. So, as we know, the public comment period is 120 days. Um, the public comment period will is tentatively scheduled to end on July 7th. And once we have those comments, um, we're working on a plan to analyze and synthesize them. So we want to make sure that they're organized in a way that it facilitates a discussion with the working group on any um, possible changes that we might want to wait to the criteria before it's, you know, I say, quote, unquote, finalized, because, as you know, we'll be going back through this, you know, on an annual basis. Um, so. There, there's always going to be, I guess, an opportunity to make changes and adjust criteria, but at least, you know, final, we'll say final for now, <laughs> I guess, or final for, you know, when we finish it. Um, so, m keeping in mind, we don't have the staff capacity to share comments in real time. And so, we're going to need to review it, you know, any comments that we get where obviously we want to make sure that they're reviewed to remove any personal identifying information from any of the comments. We want to make sure we're respecting everyone's privacy, but we do um, intend to share the full analysis of the comments uh, after the public comment period closes. And we will definitely provide more details of our plan uh, on the comments once we have that all settled. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, Alana. Not a question Hi. about this per, per, uh, per se, but just uh, I just want to make a, a recommendation about the overall process, but I, I don't want to keep sure. interrupting you, so I'll wait till you're done <laughs> with, okay. with this part of it. Oh, no, that's fine. Yep. Go ahead. Um, just uh, it, what I'm, I'm going to point out, um, I'm going to make a recommendation and point out um, uh, a dynamic playing out this year uh, that 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 might be borderline in politic. Not not on my part. It's just it's it's just the we're we're approaching the silly season this year. It's an election year, uh, and, and the reason I'm saying this is <laughs> that um, we've already seen uh, a lot, and it's been it's it's it it began a few months ago, and it is increasing. And by it, I mean um, attacks on the CLCPA overall, like we've been, we've seen, uh, an uptick, um, whether it's, um, fossil fuel based interests or, or, or some of the more, um, uh, nearsighted business interests in, in, in the state that, uh, somehow seem to think that their businesses will survive a climate apocalypse. Right. But, um, increasingly we're seeing attacks all over the place on the CLCPA. Uh, and, and the reason I'm saying I'm raising this now is I just I, I, I urge the state, uh, all, you know, the agencies, the governor's office, really lean in this year, and and try to build, um, uh, you know, the kind of political support that I don't think we've done a whole lot of since, and, and you know, for, for, for a variety of reasons, but we haven't done uh, a lot of that since the law passed. But I think this is this is we're approaching a moment where uh, environmental justice, climate justice, and and frankly all the other climate advocates in the state uh, and state government um, have have uh, at least this much in common. We all want to see this plan succeed. Um, there are other interests in the state that they they don't share that 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 desired outcome. Um, so the reason I'm saying all this is that I would urge. Uh, especially since you know we're 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 in the draft scoping uh, plan process, we're kicking off the climate justice working group. At the very least, I would urge uh, the state to engage the uh, the Black, Puerto Rican, Latino, and Asian caucus. Like like talk, you know, make sure that the legislators that are most likely to represent DAX to lean on you know collaborate with their offices and and make sure that they're helping promulgate, you know, these hearings, make sure that they're doing their, you know, whether it's in their constituent newsletters or e-blasts or whatever, but this should, this should be an all hands on deck moment, not just the governor's office and not just the agencies and us, but legislators, a lot of who champion this bill. Uh, and, and I say this because, you know, there's going to come a moment when um, hard choices are going to get made. And if we don't have an informed, motivated constituency to push back, 
uh, things that we all agree on uh, are going to have are going to be harder roads to hoe. Um, so I just want to again urge if if the state agencies and the governor's office haven't done so, uh, please do what you can to engage. You know, not just even state legislators, but try to reach uh, legislators that that have a stake in this to help publicize and help mobilize people for this. Thank you, Eddie. I'd like to uh, respond if I can, uh, Alana. Uh, thanks. I, I appreciate that. I, I wanted to, you know, underscore some, some comments that Alana made earlier, just regarding our overall strategy for for this comment period. Uh, you know, is to focus on outreach and education. Um, and we think we can really build momentum uh, and support for the climate act by meeting people where they are and giving them tailored information about how. Uh, uh, particularly for uh, the, the DAC criteria could impact their own community um, and we think we can get uh, a lot more support by by proactively doing that outreach and giving people this information so that they don't even in the best case scenario where we get huge max WebEx turnout in all of our hearings in person, you know, we're not gonna be able to meet all the millions of people uh, that live in this, that live in disadvantaged communities. But if we can, uh, if, we're, if we're strategic and proactive in our outreach and give them tailored information, we hope to empower New Yorkers to be able to submit comments and to, to be involved in this process. Even if you can't make one of our WebEx meetings uh, or, or one of our hearings in person, uh, and when we rolled out the, the criteria last week, uh, just for, for your awareness and the awareness of the working group here, um, we uh, sort of did the, uh, an analysis of, of the uh, elected officials who are, uh, whose districts are, are mostly disadvantaged communities. And we proactively reached out to them saying, that, hey, this is coming out, this impacts your district um, and, and sent them the, the information so that they know, uh, knew about it. We did that with, uh, with state legislators, but to your point, I think we have this comment period until July, right? We can we can continue that outreach. We can expand to local elected officials. We can expand to mayor's offices and really just trying to find the champions wherever they are to, to help uh, spread the word uh, uh, as much as possible. Can I, can I ask yeah, a question? And Adriana, if I could just add to that, at the same time, we'll be doing the, the hearings on the scoping plan around the state, and that's another great opportunity to get out to all the corners of the state where we haven't really been over the last two years of COVID to, to you know, engage people in the solutions that are identified in the scoping plan. So, you know, encourage all members of the Climate Justice Working Group to to participate in, in those hearings. Um, it's a great opportunity to, to reach the public. Elizabeth, you had a question? Yeah, I did. Um, I was wondering how you're using comms for this, whether you're creating PSAs, uh, whether you're reaching out to ethnic media, Spanish speaking media, I think that if you only reach out to the people that are already involved, you're going to bring in the choir. And this is an opportunity to reach, uh, to use uh, not just social media, but to actually use um, film, you know, video uh, and other forms of messaging to reach out to um, vast uh, media outlets that are ethnic media that are always ignored. Our people are reading that. And so you, if, if you are going to reach them where they are, then you, you need to have a comms plan that makes it possible for them to go beyond listening to elected officials, which they may not be listening to. That's a great point, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, Abby. So I really appreciate that we're having this discussion. It sounds like, you know, the, that you all are doing a lot of really good work and have solid plans in place for, for how to get the word out about this and educate the community. My question is just, what is the expectation um, in terms of our, or our role, specifically members of the Climate Justice Working Group, but more broadly, the climate movement and organizations like ours? Um, and I ask, and this is kind of in response to Kathleen's comment um, about concern about lack of public comments in Mohawk Valley, Hudson Valley, and Finger Lakes regions. Because I know what we're experiencing as an organization, I can only speak, you know, for my organization, is that we just do not have the capacity or bandwidth to really be meaningfully engaged in a lot of this and to be, you know, educating the community about this opportunity. Um, and I know, you know, the clean energy hubs are coming and there's some of that is designed to 
just have you know boots on the ground to do some of the community organizing around and you know engagement in policy questions. Um, but that's not happening till later, and this is happening now. So I guess it's a it's two part question. One, what are you expecting of us? And two, like, will there be uh, in addition to you know the material resources that are provided, like educational videos or I don't know social media graphics, perhaps things like that. Is there actually any staff capacity you can help us with to be able to get out and educate our communities? Well, what we definitely want you to do is to the extent you can, you know, spread the word. Um, we definitely want, you know, have as many community members as possible weighing in on the, you know, during the public comment period and even after. And um, also, if you are having difficulties, if there is sort of like a bandwidth issue, let us know, because uh, I think that's the goal of these sort of smaller sessions or this, you know, I jokingly call it the road show is that, you know, we'll come to you and we can, you know, if you can't come to these hearings, if you don't have the time, you just don't, we'll come to you uh, just to make sure that, you know, you understand the process and, you know, so you know exactly what you're getting to before you, you know, leave public comments. And we understand that there could be a lack of, you know, comments in areas like the Finger Lakes and in the Mid Hudson region that, you know, so we definitely want to make sure that we're targeting those areas where we may not get comments because we don't want, if there are any major issues, we want to make sure we know about them. If there are errors or anything like that, we want to make sure that we know so that we're not going forward with anything that could potentially hurt any of our communities. So, you know, basically let us know what's going on. Uh, Keep us informed. Um, make sure if you are having difficulties reaching out to people, let us know and who we should be reaching out to. Um, if there are groups that want to host uh, us to have some of these smaller sessions, once we get them off the ground, you know, definitely point them out and we can reach out to them. Thank you, Alana. I I am officially letting you know now that there are bandwidth concerns, but I will follow up with you. Okay. And and I think the roadshow is going to help. What I'm kind of referring to, though, just to provide a little more context is like the actual community organizing that has to happen, even just to get people to show up to the roadshow thing. Right. So the preliminary work that has to happen, and this is a much bigger, longer term, you know, thing that the availability of funding, at least in regions like ours for that kind of community, like just really boots on the ground work. Um, it's something we're struggling with and, and there just has to be money from the state for that kind of work. Okay. Well, I can't promise any money right now. Um, that would be responsible of me, but we could definitely, um, have some conversations internally and see what we can do or see what kind of, uh, what, if anything can be provided. And yes, Elizabeth, I see your comment, uh, about PSAs in multiple languages. And I just want to add that, uh, you know, we're, we're still in develop, we're still in development, uh, developing our, our plan here, but that's why this conversation is really timely so that we're able to, you know, incorporate, uh, the, uh, feedback, like we're hearing from Elizabeth for, to make sure we've got an, uh, a solid, uh, comms plan for, for ethnic media and reaching being intentional about reaching out to that press and PSAs and capacity to help, uh, with outreach. And so, uh, just. You know, just saying that we're still developing our, our plan and this, like hearing your feedback now is really helpful um, as we firm up those those details. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions, comments, concerns when it comes to uh, our plan? Mind you, you don't have to say so now if you want to email me later and, you know, if you've Thought it over and you know you have something that's burning in your heart you can definitely reach out i'm always willing to listen and take criticism yes webex is the worst and even though we <laughs> have a contract with them yes eddie i hear you um but other than you know webex concerns <laughs> does anyone else have any other questions concerns you know, let me let me just add because it, it may not seem like a big deal that WebEx is so challenging for even those of us that are good with this with with uh, this technology, but for folks on the ground, um, it can be really challenging. So, providing people with advance notice of how to do it that they have to use Google Chrome, just walking them through it, um, 
so that on the day of, uh, while they're trying to check in, it's not challenging and they feel shut out. I think that that's important advance notice to provide. If the intention here is to make sure that people are engaged in this process and that we're also building climate consciousness, then we need to be really mindful of all the different ways in which uh, we are privileged in understanding how to access information and many people in our community are not. So it's an opportunity to even build the capacity of the state to be better at communicating with people in our communities. Absolutely. Thank you, Elizabeth. We, I think that that's a good idea if we, you know, maybe send something out ahead of time or make uh, at least some sort of process, you know, documentation aware for folks uh, who are using WebEx that they might have things they have to download ahead of time, et cetera, would probably be very useful. Um, as Adriana said, we can, we'll look into other platforms. We can't promise uh, anything, but we can definitely uh, have conversations and look into other platforms. Okay. Uh, I guess last slide. Uh, so next steps, obviously, will be building out um, our plans, building out the public engagement plan, um, building out our hearings plan, and uh, definitely keeping everybody aware of what's going on. Um, I will not be able to, I'll try to provide as much, as many updates as possible during meetings on our engagement uh, for the website, just to let folks know where we are on comments and uh, the goal will be. Like I said, it's I'm not going to be able to do that in real time, or but we'll definitely try to update you all as often as possible. Uh, does anybody have any questions, concerns, comments before we close things out for today? I have a question for the working group. Uh, just on on the next step, you know, as Alana mentioned, we uh, are starting to are starting to firm up our plans on public engagement and the other items that we talked about today and just my question for the working group is would it be helpful uh, to have uh, another meeting to present to you all on the you know once we get finalize the details on our hearing schedule and, and public engagement plan um, or you know want to be respectful of uh, the, your time and lots of demand for your time and attention uh, so I'm also happy to follow up by sharing uh, sharing plans via email if that's preferred, but I wanted to put that to the group. Okay, hearing tentatively from Eddie, don't have a strong preference from Abby. Okay. Thanks, Ono. Oh, and you know what, uh, now that we have a few extra people who uh, did get on the call, um, I kind of wanted to circle back quickly to the minutes. Um, if, I, if everybody had an opportunity to review the minutes, I was hoping that we could uh, vote on the approval of the minutes from our meeting in January so those can get posted on the Climate Justice Working Group uh, meeting site. So, if we could go back to slide 5, Andrea. So, uh, did anybody have any statements or any concerns with regards to the minutes? Okay. Um, if anyone could just indicate with sort of a raise of your hand, or I don't know if I have to do a formal <laughs> call for a member to discuss. Oh, no, we didn't discuss windmills, but I thought that that would be a pretty picture. Josh, I'm have, sorry. Yeah, I didn't have, I didn't have a photo of uh, what approving minutes would be. So <laughs> that's kind of the best. Uh, Joe has uh, voted to uh, raise approving minutes. So if folks could just indicate either by a raise of the hand or uh, note whether or not they would like to approve. Thank you, Abby. Jill. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. Rawa, I approve. Thank you, Rawa. We've got Sonal and Jill in the chat and Eddie, although it looks like reluctantly Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, the minutes uh, for the January 10th meeting are approved and they will be posted on the climate, uh, just climate.ny.gov website for everyone to view. And with that is the kind of final business for today. Um, again, if anybody has any questions or comments before we close things out and I return four minutes of your day to you. Thank you. I'll take the four minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, for taking time out of your very busy schedules to do this with us. Um, I will try to make sure uh, that I get information out to you as soon as possible and that uh, I'll send a doodle poll for our next meeting uh, with some dates, proposed dates very soon. Uh, and we'll continue to be in touch via email. And again, questions, comments, concerns, feel free to send them to us. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.